Welcome to another edition of Boxing Info. I'm your host, Guy Allender, and this is the Results Show week ending June the 21st with a look ahead of, to uh, next week's bouts as well. So let's get right to it. We've got a lot of results and a lot of schedule to cover. I'm pleasantly surprised with the action this past weekend. Uh, back on the 19th, ESPN2 from Laredo, Texas. Uh, this is not something I got to see, and this is because college baseball, for those of you who are overseas and don't know what ESPN is, it's our kind of like all day, all sports. Uh, channel probably something like Sky or uh, I don't know what you have over Satanta or something like that but it, it, it's round the clock and there's multiple channels of it so every week ESPN2 has a boxing card but they also show other things like college baseball for instance and that's going on right now the championships and without telling anybody they switched the Beltran Monte Mesa Clay fight card to a different one of their channels without telling anybody so as I went past there I saw the baseball was on and I went right to versus to see you know the other fight well, the results for Beltran was he threw over 1,300 punches and landed, I think, over 30% of them. And Monty Mesa Clay threw over 1,000 punches over the, over the uh, 12 rounds and scored a 20-something percent connect ratio. Uh, real good fight, and Beltran has redeemed himself from a couple of title fight losses and won a well-deserved unanimous decision. Uh, you know, Monty Mesa Clay just was in the wrong place at the wrong time in this fight, and I think that both... Uh, you know, fairly solid contenders, so I look to see both of them again. A good win for Fernando Beltran Jr. Uh, on the Versus Network, I was more than pleasantly surprised with the way this went down. Adrian Diakonu defending his WBC 175 pound strap against Jean Pascal. And, you know, the thing is, I was not too high on Jean Pascal. I know I picked him to, to get by in this fight like he did. Uh, the scores were a little wider than I thought. I thought this was like a seven rounds to five kind of a thing with maybe an extra point for a knockdown. So it would be like, you know, uh, you know, a 115, 112, or 116, 113 kind of a thing, you know, some, with some crazy scores. But he, he won this wider than that on two of the three judges' scorecards. Uh, it's going to be a candidate for five of the year. It's going to be a candidate for round of the year, round five. Because what happened is traditionally, like everybody thought, Diakonu came at him stalking him. Pascal did not run from Diakonu. He flurried and moved, reset, and did it over and over again. There was no running. Uh, you know, the thing about this is, and what has really impressed me with Pascal against um, Carl Frosch over in England, and again in this fight, is that he, when the going's gotten tough with the competition, him stepping up the competition, he has manned up. I mean, there was times in this fight that he could have caved in, and you know, Diakonu cracked him over and over again with right hands off the side of the head in the temple. Uh, but it was a great back and forth fight because you know Diakonu would have his moments and Pascal knew when the last 15, 10 seconds, 10, 15 seconds of a round was and he'd flurry like mad. Uh, fifth round, left hook, clean left hook, down went Diakonu. He got his wits about him, eventually hurt Pascal at the end of that round and I thought he was going to get Pascal in the 10th and 11th rounds where he, you know, he was starting to take the play away from Pascal and Pascal was flurrying to, to steal those rounds. But in the 12th round, without a doubt, Pascal had Diakono hurt. And I don't know whether he was too tired or he just didn't uh, know he had him as hurt as he did. Because Diakono started giving, giving ground. But for the first time in the fight, he started backing up and giving ground. And uh, Pascal, well-deserved victory. You know, the brightest thing that could happen from this is now Chad Dawson has an opponent. And enough of this, we're going to just give up titles to fight the money fights. No. The, the whole thing is, is you get all the titles together and then let them go splinter because we'll know who the man is. And this is the perfect, you know, I wouldn't be surprised next we'll hear Bernard Hopkins calling out Joan Pascal. They'll do a big fight up there in, uh, in, in Montreal and sell it out and this and that because, you know, that's the way he, he goes about cherry picking his opponents. But at the, at the very least, I think Joan Pascal is going to be fighting Silvio Bronco anyway because um, he's owed a shot at this title. Uh, and then down the road, and he should be able to beat him. And then down the road from there, hopefully Chad Dawson. This is uh, see, people were asking me, what does Chad Dawson need? Look at the other title list; it will come, and it's it's happening. Okay, enough time on that. June twentieth, uh, a couple of fights in Germany on ESPN Classic, which is the channel the night before that ended up showing Beltran that I didn't know about because it doesn't say that on my guide, on my Direct TV guide. Um, Vladimir Klitschko basically impaled Ruslan Chudayev on the end of his jab. I thought it was going to be similar to the Ibrahimov fight. In some ways it was, but in other ways at least Chudayev tried to force the action more. Uh, got hit with a wicked one-two in the second round and went down. And, you know, basically he did score enough to raise some, you know, some, like a welt or a bruise under uh, 
Klitschko's eye, but at the same time, he was on the receiving end, playing catcher more than he was pitching. And, you know, uh, another solid win for Vladimir Klitschko. Uh, you know, what's next for him? He needs to get the Povetkin thing out of the way. And then if David Hay really is serious about fighting him or fighting Vitaly, you know, set that up later on late this year. Um, I have a feeling Vladimir is only going to fight once more this year anyway, and it's probably going to be the Povetkin fight. Uh, but a really good, solid, decisive win for Vladimir Klitschko in a fight that now he has got the ring belt. And in my mind, the WBO, the WBA, and the IBF belts as well. Because I don't care what the silly WBA says about value of having a claim after that pitiful performance against Holyfield and Chigayev being champion in recess. Chigayev has never lost that belt. He's no, and, and, and here's another thing. Heavyweight champions, as you may note this, this is as true as can be. Any heavyweight titleist or champion can never fight a non-title bout. Because anything is a heavyweight can be a heavy, heavyweight title fight. There is no fighting outside the heavyweight division. Everything qualifies. So a heavyweight champion can never fight. Technically, I mean, they, I'm sure it's been done in the past, but in, in exhibitions, as people will know. But technically, a sanctioned, I mean, a real athletic commission fight can really technically never be a non-title fight. So in my mind, Vladimir Klitschko's got the WBA belt, and he's got three out of the four of them now. And, and, and value of is inconsequential. Okay, Monterey, Mexico. Edgar Sosa scored an impressive fifth round TKO. This is another one that I had to watch on internet feed, or I should say video, against Panama's Carlos Melo. This was title defense number nine for Edgar Sosa. He has been very busy since annexing this title from, uh, I think it was the vacant title that he had won uh, fighting Brian Valoria when uh, Omar Nino was stripped. And he has just been chugging along. This is a prime example of a fighter who has gotten better from winning a title. And Sosa, at the same, you know, at the same time we look at it, he scored a vicious left hook to the body that sent Milo down, and he followed up, and they stopped the fight not too long after that in the fifth round. I, you know, I'm not sure who his promoter is, but. They need to get him in another high-profile fight and possibly a unification fight with and a rematch with Brian Vloria, who looks like he's rejuvenated. Uh, he has already fought, um, I'm trying to think who, uh, he's got five losses, but they're to quality, most, most of them are to quality opponents, so it's going to be interesting in that division. All right, real quick, this coming weekend, June 26, Friday Night Fights on ESPN, Danny Jacobs taking on George Walton, 10-round middleweight fight. I'm going with Danny Jacobs here. It's coming from Tucson. Hopefully ESPN won't move it around like they've done the last couple of weeks. Uh, going with Jacobs here. Rama, Ont Ontario, Canada. This is not on TV, at least that I know of, and is tentative scheduling. Stevie Molitor making his comeback from his four-round blowout at the hands of Celestine Caballero, taking on Heriberto Ruiz in a 12-round, 122-pound fight. In Chicago, also not televised, tentatively scheduled, Fresno Kendo is taking on Mark Brown in a 10-round heavyweight fight. Look for Fres to pull that one off. In Buenos Aires, Argentina, also Friday night, not televised here in the United States, Omar Navarez, I believe he is making title defense number 15 or number 16 against Omar Soto. I believe it's, it's probably his 16th title defense. He is, I don't know if he is boxing's longest reigning champion, but he's definitely up there in the number of title defenses now. And some of you just scoff and say he's not fought anybody. And, you know, it's like, the, you know, but he fought the guy from Georgia in his last fight, um, Rayon, Raynow, Rayon Whitfield. So he's fought somebody I've seen fight um, in any event. So he just keeps chugging along. And I really would like to see, you know, these fighters get together and unify. And I'm going to go with Narvaez in this fight, although you never know when he's going to have a letdown. Uh, the next day, June 27th, and there's been some changes, and I've got to go through this real quickly. Top-ranked pay-per-view, Juan Manuel Lopez defending his WBO 122-pound belt against Olivier Lonchi. Lonchi. By the time we learn how to pronounce his name correctly, he's going to be gone probably. Look for Lopez to score a stoppage in this fight. Uh, how early, I don't know. Don't bet on a first-rounder, but it's not going to, I don't think it's going to take too long. Yuri Foreman, Jorge Arce, and Demetrius Hopkins are also going to be on this card. I'm not sure how much they're selling it for, but it's it's out there on uh, Saturday. Also Saturday, Los Angeles, HBO, there's been some changes. Victor Ortiz is still fighting Marcos Medania for the vacant WBA interim 140-pound belt that's all held by Andreas Koltanek, and his fight's been postponed against, you know, uh, um, 
Amir Khan um, is one of the many that's been postponed. They're fighting for this belt. Rocky Warriors was slated to fight against Chris John. Chris John has pulled out, and it's serious. He collapsed, had a fainting spell in training. They rushed him to the doctor, had a blood test, and found out he has a blood condition. It might be something like anemia, but he's not going to be fighting anytime soon. They're trying to get another fight for Rocky Warriors. They threw around some names, but I don't know if HBO has approved it. Also, Showtime, same-day coverage in Berlin. Arthur Abraham defending his IBF 160-pound strap against someone named Mahir Oral. Uh, I'm expecting Abraham to win this fight. I don't look for a letdown, and we'll see how that goes. Uh, so I've got Abraham, I've got Navayas, I've got Fresno Kendall, Steve Maldon, Dane Jacobs, Victor Ortiz, and Rocky Juarez. That's going to be it for this show. Thanks, everybody.